Hi, I'm Igor Smirnov from Remote Chess Academy. In this lesson, called Unlocking the Grandmaster's Mind, I'd like to discuss with you a very interesting and important topic how grandmasters actually think while playing a game of chess. Why is this topic so interesting? When you observe certain top players commenting on their games during a press conference or in any video lesson, Usually those guys show you tons of different variations that could happen in various possible lines. It seems like those guys see completely everything. However, it's not necessarily true. The variations that they show you might not relate to the actual thinking process of a chess player. Some of those variations they are just their home preparation. Some lines they indeed calculated during the game, some lines they discovered while analyzing the game afterwards with their seconds or with a computer, and some variations they will simply never show you because it is their secret weapons which they hope to use in their next games. Therefore, this question remains to be open. Even if you have observed a couple of very interesting variations that could happen in a game of Carlsen or whatever top player, it still doesn't clarify to you exactly how can you find such br brilliant moves in your own games within a short amount of time. Next you may be wondering this question. Okay, it's hard to calculate long lines, at least it's hard to make it right, not to overlook anything. But what about knowing the strategic and tactical motifs, not knowing the typical plans in different openings? What if you just study them and apply? Shouldn't it clarify everything for you? From one hand, of course it should, and it could definitely help. But from the other hand, knowing lots of different things about a chess game pretty often can even add more chaos to your thinking process. There are so many different things you need to keep in mind while playing. You need to care about the center, about the planning, open lines, weak squares. You need to care about the tactical motifs, calculate the variations, evaluate positions. And there are so many different things you need to analyze. The simple practical question is, how can you do that within just one, two minutes of time that you have for one move? Let's have a look at a specific example. It is the game between Nydorf and Pologayevsky, two famous players of the past. Here it is black to move. Imagine that you're playing this position and think for a moment of how would you play here as black. You may even pause the video, think for a moment and then continue watching the lesson. There are a couple of possibilities for black. Black can, for example, take the pawn on a3, black can maybe push the pawn, black can take the knight on f3, jump with the knight to g4, jump with the knight to d5, maybe do something else, bring the knight back into play with knight c6, and perhaps there are some other possibilities as well. When you face such a situation with so many possible moves, while each of them looks completely logical, it may be really frustrating. The general chess rules don't help you that much because again, all of these moves are following some chess rules and all of them are logical. The thing you would try to do here is to calculate variations. However, still it's quite difficult to calculate all of them and to do it accurately because there are so many possibilities both for white and for black on every move of your calculation. Let's say you try to calculate the move knight to g4. Okay, here you will need to calculate the consequences of white's sacrifice on e6 with a knight or maybe with a bishop. And there will be very long and complex lines after that. Again, we're talking about just one possibility that black has in the initial position, knight g4. While apart from that, black has plenty of other options. You see that? the situation is really, really tough. 
A few observe an analysis of this game made by a certain top grandmaster. He will show you tons of variations in all of these lines and in the end will prove that one of these moves is objectively the best. Again, this is rather a theoretical analysis than a practical game decision. During a practical game you need to play the right move within 1-2 minutes. You don't have time to calculate all those lines accurately. Ok, now let's think how should you approach this position and find the right move if you are playing the real practical game. The very first thing you should be caring about is the safety of your king, that's for sure. Here we can see the pretty huge concentration of white's forces around black's king. Almost all of the white species, maybe except for the rook in the corner on the a1, are targeting the black's king. If you look at all of the white's minor pieces, the rook on e1, the queen on d3, all of them are looking there in the direction of black's king. All of them are ready to take actions pretty soon. If you see the situation like that, you need to be extremely careful. In such situations you should know that very often your opponent will have a certain combination. Not necessarily it will appear right now, but it has great chances to appear during one of the following moves. That's why the first thing that black should try to do here is to reduce the concentration of white's forces that look at black's king. With that being said, I like a lot the move b3 that black can play here, because it helps you to neutralize one of the most aggressive white species. The bishop on a2 were looking indirectly onto black's king and could have support white's different sacrifices along this diagonal onto e6. So when you play the move b3, you shut this possibility down for white. Now, which variations do you need to calculate before playing this move? Well, obviously white will take the pawn, most likely. And after that, after a little consideration, you can see that at least black can equalize the game pretty easily. If you just take this bishop, queen takes, now your bishop on to b7 is under the attack, but you can eliminate the knight on a 3 in order to capture the pawn on the d4 on the next move. Now you see that a few exchanges has happened, the position was simplified a lot, now you are completely safe and therefore if you found just this position into your calculation it already means that you may play that initial move b3. No f further calculations are required. Now you can see that when you have the right focus things become really easy for you. Initially it seemed like black needs to calculate lots of variations here, while in reality you see that it's enough to calculate one short and simple variation. You may be wondering, but what about all other moves black could have played here? Should you calculate the moves like b takes a3, knight to g4 or, or something else, or bishop takes a3 here? Well, of course, you may spend little time there, but again, you need to be very careful. You need to know that if your opponent has a huge concentration of forces against you, the possibility of the attack and some combinations is really huge for him. So if black really plays something like knight g4, white will probably start with knight takes e6, and although it's not the end of the variation, black is not obliged to take, you can do something else like queen d7, the position is still sharp, but in such variations there is a big chance that you can overlook something and you can lose. Also, you will have to spend a lot of time for calculating those lines. You may be spending like 10 minutes, 20 minutes for calculating this single variation. There is a big chance that in the end of the game you will end up in a time trouble and can lose the game just because of the time factor. That's why I don't recommend that you go into such lines when you are under the attack, when, when the position is dangerous, and even though you could balance, but it is so dangerous for you. Okay, let's go back. 
Again, something similar might happen in the line of bishop takes a3, queen takes a3, queen to d4. Again, I'm showing this position just for uh, illustrative purposes. I'm not recommending that you actually go into those calculations. And then knight takes e6, let's say. Again, you see that situation is really complex. So I can take the knight, which is probably bad, or maybe take queen takes b2. The position is very difficult to evaluate. Both players has their chances. You need to spend the whole life analyzing those variations, and that's why I don't recommend that you do that. Going back to the beginning and making some intermediate conclusion, we can say that you can play b3 mainly taking into account the key factor. The key factor is the safety of your king. And the idea that you need to decrease the quantity of white species focused against your king. Before playing the move b3, it's enough to calculate a short variation after the exchanges of minor pieces, the knights and, uh, and bishops, which shows you that at least you have the equal, equal game there. Therefore, you can play b3 without any other thinking, and you may play the move like that after just one minute of thinking. It's pretty easy. Okay, let's go next. White certainly took the pawn. Now there is the next question for you. How do you play here for black? There is another advice I'd like to give you. When you play the game, you need to outplay your opponent. You need to outthink him. That's why you need to do something that your opponent could have missed. One of the great ideas that can help you that work very often is the intermediate move. They might happen very often if you look for them. What's the point of intermediate moves? When you calculate a certain exchange, like this, let's say, black played b3 and now we know that white is going to take the pawn, then black will take, and white will take with the queen. Normally that's how players calculate such lines. In their mind, they do it like that. I take this, he takes, and I retake. You see that players stop thinking about other possibilities that are possible except for the recapture. So here, after bishop takes b3, and in any exchange variations, I recommend that you look for eventual intermediate moves. For instance, here black indeed has one, which is bishop to e4. Before capturing the bishop on b3, black gains the extra tempo while activating the bishop putting it on a strong central square. Now white has to retreat. If white tries to take the bishop with a rook, then after knight takes b3, white's both rooks are hanging, and it's hard to find any real tactical possibilities for, for white. Therefore, it's not good for him. In the actual game, after bishop to e4, white retreated back, queen to d1. Now black took the bishop, which was the initial purpose of his move b3 to eliminate one of the main white's defenders, oh, sorry, attackers of the black's king, and white obviously recaptured. Now we have the new position where black needs to make the next decision. There are a few logical alternatives for black. One of them is to regain the material to capture back the pawn. Black can take the knight on f3 and after that capture that pawn on the d4. That is one possibility. We have already observed that before. In addition to that, black can try to play for the initiative, leaving pieces on the board and making active moves like rook b8 or bishop c2 or something like that. What would you choose here for black? Well, first of all, let me tell you one little hint. Bishop is generally stronger than a knight, while in open positions this advantage is really huge. Very often, a bishop against a knight can compensate a pawn deficit for you. Therefore, I would say that here the material is pretty much balanced. Your bishop should be enough compensation for lack of pawn, and that's why you may not worry that much about your material disadvantage. Now let's think next. 
If you have a few approximately equal possibilities, while all of them look unclear and you can't decide which one is better, I would recommend that you choose the, the line where your position is more initiative. What do I mean to say by that? Let's say you take on f3 and just simply take the pawn back. Yes, your position is safe, that's for sure. You have exchanged most of the white's active pieces, you took back the pawn, you're attacking the pawn on b2, everything seems to be great. From the other hand, white doesn't have any problems either. Well, he can, of course, protect the pawn somehow, maybe move it, and on the next move he'll play like rook d1, all of his moves are natural, his position is completely safe as well, and he doesn't experience any problems at all. Now let's go back to the position of our last choice. Unlike that, if you do something active, if you play like rook b8 or let's say bishop c2, then you cause much more problems for your opponent. Of course he's not losing, his position is not terribly bad, but now he has to think, he has to play accurately, and therefore you make his task harder while your task easier. You know what you're going to do on the next moves. You're going to attack, to move forward and try to um, somehow chase his forces and attack his pawns and cause problems for him. For example, if white plays like queen e3, which is a bad idea, like can go knight g4, taking the queen and bishop on h6. Here white is just losing. Therefore, white has to move the queen to some other square. In the game he played queen a2. And here, in the actual game, black played knight g4, but I just want to highlight the fact that even if you have no specific tactical actions, playing such a position as black is much easier for you. Because white's pieces are a little bit stuck on the edge. The white's bishop is on the edge, now the queen is on the corner, and even if you play something simple like queen b6 without any immediate tactics and you want to just play maybe bishop b3 and lock his pieces in the corner, you still see that the position is much easier practically for black. You'll play bishop b3, you'll invade into the open c file, you can place your another rook on the d8, you can move the knight somewhere forward to g4 to d5, Everything is easy for you. You can play your moves instantly uh, within just a few seconds of thinking. While your opponent will have to think hard and figure out what to do, the white's plan is not that clear, and all in all, practically, you're posing much serious problems for your opponent. That's why I would recommend that you choose situations where you have more initiative position, even if it costs you little material like it was a pawn in our example. If we talk about this particular game, black played knight g4 here, which is the most energetic move because the, the, the bishop on h6 is simply trapped. White tried the last trick, knight takes e6. It's not a real sacrifice because after f takes, white is going to recapture with a queen and then take the knight back. Therefore, it's not a sacrifice of material for white. However, black prepared a cool reply, queen to b6. Now the problem for white is that lots of his pieces are hanging. Black is still attacking that bishop on h6. Bishop b3 is a very serious and annoying threat for white. And the knight on e6 is still hanging. In some of the variations, black will simply capture it. All in all, white is unable to protect all of his pieces, and pretty soon he resigned. What's the key takeaway for you from this game? Initially, the situation looked very complex for both sides with lots of possibilities and necessity to calculate a lot of lines. Also, it looked quite dangerous for you initially because white is ready to take a shot and ready to go into a direct attack against black's king. At the same time, during our discussion you've seen that if you know how to set your mind to the right things, 
then you can spot the right idea easily and you can execute it with minimum calculation because you don't need to calculate everything but only the really minimum necessary lines. And if you have this practical knowledge which all strong experienced players have then playing chess games will be easy for you and you will avoid getting into the positions where there is a chance for you to overlook something. Apart from that we also have discussed some of the chess ideas that I hope will be helpful for you during your games. And now let's come back to our discussion about the thinking process of strong players. You can see that there is a big difference between theoretical knowledge about chess and the actual practical thinking process. In theory, you need to take into account all the main strategic and tactical motifs, you need to compose the plans, you need to evaluate different factors of the position such as king safety, center, open lines, weak squares, prophylaxis and many other things. Then you need to calculate lots of variations, come up with the candidate moves and calculate each line until the end and so forth. This is in theory. If we come to practice, in a practical game you need to play the right move within a few minutes, sometimes within a few seconds. Therefore you need to think quickly and efficiently. That's why, in order to help you be the great practical player, we have created the course where we summarized how GMs actually think while playing a game of chess. I've cooperated with Maxim Blagy and other grandmasters, my friends. Those guys have spent many years to become strong experienced players. Now they have summarized it for you within one short and concise course. I'm sure you'll enjoy learning it and also I'm sure that after learning this course and locking the Grandmaster's mind you will really understand how Grandmasters think while playing a chess game and most importantly you will be able to do the same. I'm wishing you nice games and pleasant victories. Talk to you soon.